this morning like to do part two of a seven-week series on really the things I've learned and really being overwhelmed, but not with a hospital, but overwhelmed with the goodness of God, the grace of God, and the love of God. Now, last week we took a look at overwhelmed by the love of God. Today, we're going to take a look at what does it really mean to be overwhelmed by the grace of God. People sometimes come into a church and pastors, again, begin to look at that person. What can they do for a church? And I think that's wrong. I don't think it's what you can do for a church. I think it's what God wants to do for you. And as God begins to love you, as God begins to show His grace and His gifts to you by forgiveness, and God begins to redeem you and accept you in His beloved, then it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And it's out of the love of God that constrains me to want to give God and do things for God and not gripe about it. If I'm griping about doing something for God, then I shouldn't do it. If I don't want to help, I shouldn't help. In other words, there's nothing on you that tells you that you have to come and be an usher or you have to do this. The only reason you should do anything is because you are so in love with God and God is so in love with you that you just want to help. You feel like you're part of His kingdom. You feel like you're part of really the body of Christ. You feel like your life is somewhat together and you can help others. If all of a sudden all of us are trying to put tourniquets on and, and we have no arms, no legs, we've been in an accident, we're going to bleed to death. But sooner or later, some of us are going to have to begin to realize God put us here for a reason, and that's to help other people. And I am convinced that as you begin to help others, God's going to turn your captivity. And that's what he did in Job's life. So if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to take a look at a very interesting portion of Scripture one that you're not going to really want to hear because it's the genealogy. And what do we usually do with genealogy? We skip over it. So we really start Matthew in chapter 3. We never ever seem to want to read chapter 1. But there are two genealogies in Matthew. One is the royal genealogy, and the second one is the uh, human genealogy. It goes all the way back to Adam. One is the royal genealogy. That would be the kings, all the kings. And because Jeconiah sinned against God, and he was dealt with by God, and God said, you will never ever have your sons set on the throne, that was the end of that uh, genealogy in a sense, the royal genealogy. God, Satan thought that he had God because of Jeconiah. All God did was jump over to the other genealogy that went all the way back to Adam, and that's the one that Mary is found so if you are Jewish, it's because of your mother. And it was God that, you know, remember, incarnated Mary with a seed. The seed usually comes from a man, which is the bloodline. And because God bypassed the bloodline, then he brought the blood from heaven into Mary, and all of a sudden we have a sinless man. And we all of a sudden have a Christ that's willing to die. So you have two genealogies that go there. But what I want to share with you is not that, though that's important, but four different women that are mentioned in this genealogy. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because you're never going to remember it. I can do it. I've done it. But there are four things I'd like you to underline in your Bible, and they're found right here in verses 1 through 6. One is Tamar. Tamar. She is part of this genealogy. The second you're going to find is Rahab. Rahab the harlot is in this genealogy. The third name you're going to want to underline is Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. She is in this genealogy. And the last one you're going to want to underline is Bathsheba. She is an adulteress, and she is in this genealogy. So the first thing we're going to realize right off the bat is why in the world would God put into his genealogy these four wicked women? And the answer, very simply, is because God identified with them. God was not ashamed of them. Now, sometimes we get ashamed of people. We get ashamed of our children. We get ashamed of, you know, our wives, our spouses. We get ashamed of our boyfriends, and we want to get distance away. That's not the God that you have. And the reason why is that your God is a God of grace, where we oftentimes are not very graceful. We kind of love people when they love us, but we don't have the ability to love people when they hurt us. And so we attack like they attack, but God doesn't do that. And because he's God, he's able to give. So you have to understand that grace is God's unmerited favor. 
giving to you what you don't deserve. So my being here is God's gift. He held the church together. He didn't have to. He held you together. He didn't have to. All of you could have left and gone to another church, and I would not have blamed you, but you stayed. And that was just God holding things together. And so God gave me back my ministry. He didn't have to do that either. The board could have said, we're done you know, with your hospitals, but they didn't. And so it's God's gift. It's God's unmerited gift. And then we realize mercy is giving me what I do deserve. So mercy is holding back what I do deserve. Grace is giving me what I don't deserve. So it's the grace of God that's called you into the ministry. It's the grace of God that got you married, on and on and on. So we find these four interesting women in the genealogy. And the reason why they're there is because his son came from each of these women. We know that they're hooked into the line of Mary, and we see very simply that even Tamar, she was part of it. And then you go all the way down to Ruth. She eventually married Boaz, and from Boaz came Jesse. From Jesse came Jesus Christ. So now I'm very interested in this because women I would not identify with, God does identify with. And if you were God, you would not bring Rahab the harlot home, I don't think. Or would you bring Tamar the prostitute home? Or would you bring Ruth the Moabite home? Or definitely not Bathsheba, the one who committed adultery and then her grandpa hung himself. So we're looking at this incredible God that we serve and we realize that Tamar became a prostitute just for one moment. I'm going to explain that. We see, secondly, Rahab was a prostitute. She was a very prosperous prostitute. She was on the wall city. She had a home on the side of Jericho, and she knew that her city was about ready to be judged by God. We know that Ruth was a Moabite, and that nation was cursed by God. When Moses came out of Jerusalem, actually when he came out of Egypt, he came to Moab and Ammon and asked permission to go through. And Moab said, no, we're not going to let you take a shortcut. So Moses had to take the long way around, and God said, I'll curse him for that. So no Moabite to the tenth generation will be able to be accepted. And then Bathsheba, you know the story there, she went to bed with David, and then all of a sudden God killed that child, and then both David and Bathsheba had knowledge of Uriah, her husband, being murdered. And it was for Nathan, the prophet, who came and said, Nathan, what you have done is a very wicked crime. So that's what we're going to look at. But let me give you a couple of verses just to kind of whet your appetite when it comes to the grace of God. It says in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, it will be on the screen and you can jot it down. His grace is able to help you today. But none of these things moved me. In other words, nothing is going to move me in my marriage, in my business, in my country. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Why? so that I might finish the course with joy, the ministry I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify of God, the gospel of the grace of God. Very important. None of these things moved me, neither did I count my life dear, that I might finish the course with joy, the ministry God has given me, so I might do it with the grace and share the grace of God, that it was grace that gave it to me, it was grace that kept it, and it's grace that's going to get me through. In other words, it's only God that's able to do these incredible things. And then we find His grace is able to encourage us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, but that conjunction, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so you would say, yeah, I'm just kind of weird. No, 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 no. You are what you are by the grace of God. God made you high or short or wide or skinny. Put a pimple on your head maybe, I don't know. Gave you something that you don't like about yourself, but it's not the outward, it's the inward. It's when you shine for the glory of God, that beauty comes out. And so when you look for someone to marry, you don't look on the outward, you do a little bit, but you ought to get the inward, because the outward will begin to sag and have wrinkles real quick. And so the grace of God which was supposed upon me was not in vain, but I labor more abundantly than all Yet, but the grace of God which was with me. So it was the grace that made me who I am. It's the grace that gave me my wit. It's the grace of God that gave me the ability to be strong. And it's not in vain. In other words, God made you a certain way. And God wants you to be what He wants you to be. 
And then it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, His grace will supply everything I need. This is a pretty power, powerful verse. He says in verse 8, God is able, which tells me He's able, to make all grace abound towards you. So no matter what you're going through, His ability of grace is going to help you. That ye always, now check it out, having all sufficiency in all things. Do you hear that? In other words, there's never going to be a situation that God puts you in that you can't handle. There's never going to be a trial or a difficulty that you can't handle. Because with everything that comes into your life, if it's cancer, if it's whatever it might be, a loss of a child, God will give you the sufficiency for all things to handle these things. Always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to everything. In other words, you always have the potential to abound, but you have to make that decision. Are you going to walk through the window that God opens? Are you going to listen to God? Or are you going to get bitter and mad and walk away from God? Now, God's given you something that you don't even deserve. And God's willing to identify with you and claim you as his son, his daughter. He said, I'll be your God, and you will be my sons and daughters. I'll be the shepherd, and you will be the sheep. And I'll bear you. I will deliver you. I will take you out. When you walk through the fire, I will make sure you're not burnt. And when the waters overcome, I'll make sure you don't drown. I'll be that God in your life. And yet we say, well, God, how in the world could you even allow Judas to have dinner with you in the Last Supper? Because he's God. Because grace doesn't look at that. Grace always reaches out trying to win a person to the very end. We would never allow Judas to come to dinner, nor would we allow Judas to kiss us. And the reason why is because he's turned on us. And what is so profound about that story of Judas that really get to me is all these years, for three years, None of the disciples knew it was Judas. That's why each of them said, is it I? Jesus could have hinted, it's Judas, be careful of Judas, stay away from Judas. But he didn't do that. He wanted everyone to have equal terms, and so we see that. And then it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, He said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so God did not take the thorn away. God gave him that thorn. In fact, the Bible says, the thorn which I have received of the Lord. God gave him that thorn in the flesh to balance that experience he saw in heaven to kind of bring everything to balance. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding richness of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. I thank God for this verse. Why? Because I don't have to go to heaven and listen to you brag how you got there. We're all going to take our crowns off and throw them at his feet and say, worthy, worthy, worthy are you, O Lord. In other words, no one is going to be able to say, yeah, it was what I did at Calvary Chapel South Bay. No. It was the grace of God that got you there. It was the power that kept you. It's the God that encouraged you. And it's the God that wouldn't let you quit on yourself. He got you there. And one last one in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. But the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect or complete or mature, establish, strengthen, and settle in your heart. In other words, that's what God's grace can do. It can save you. It can bring security and strength into your life. And yet, the Bible tells us, don't frustrate the grace of God. God wants to do it? No, i got to work for it. Stop it. In other words, you're messing your life up. If God wants to bless you, then let God bless you. If God wants to give you a gift, then receive the gift. If God wants your help, then He's going to ask you. But He'll never do anything that He won't empower you to do it. So when I look at this story, I begin to realize, what's the difference God is willing to identify. And sometimes we get so angry, we don't want to identify with people. We don't want to be around people, and we don't want to see people. And that's not God. And that's why I love him so much. Tamar, number one. Tamar was a prostitute for just one moment of her life. It was the stories told, we're not going to read the whole thing, in Genesis chapter 38, and you can go read it later on. But let me kind of put it in a nutshell to kind of give you some insight. Judah was one of the 12 boys of Jacob. And after they sold uh, Joseph into slavery, Judah 
took it the hardest. He could not forgive himself for not really standing up. And so he left his dad. They all had a problem with Jacob because he showed favoritism towards Benjamin and Joseph. You know the story. But he took off, and Judah, who means praise, ended up in a Canaanite city. He just had enough with God. And so he felt guilty, shamed, and so he got involved with a Canaanite woman. They had three children. And when it came time for those three boys to get married, he went out and found a woman for his boys. And guess what? She would be a Canaanite. Did not even think about being a Jew, but it was a Canaanite woman named Tamar. And so the story goes on that he gave the first boy, Ur. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, and God killed him. Why? He did wickedly. That's all it says. And so she comes and she knocks on the door. Hi, Judah. How you doing? Great. Where's my son? Oh, he died. What? Oh, yeah. I don't know why, but he's dead. Now, can I have the second boy? Well, yes, I guess you can. According to the Mosaic law, you can have him. So here's my second boy. Well, he was okay. He went into the marriage. They had a relationship, but then he, he spilled his seed. In other words, he would not let her get pregnant, and God killed him. <laughs> and so she comes back and says, um, Judah, we've got a problem. Uh, your second boy died. Now, can I have your third boy? No. Get out of here. Tamar, what's wrong with you? Not only that, but the boy's young. Well, how about when he gets older? Can I have him? Yes, you can. Well, years went by. Years went by. She didn't honor. He did not honor that wish. One day, Tamar said, you're not going to honor that wish, and she's in a widow's gown. And so she found out that Judah was going to go into the city to once again sell the sheep. So she dressed into a prostitute outfit, went on the corner, and as he walked by, she did that thing that women do very well, wink. Just that cute wink. If a wife comes home and winks at you, you kind of know what that means. You're not going to get killed or something, or, you know, you're, you're okay, she winks at you, you know, okay, well, yeah, yeah, how you doing? What do you, what do you want? How much do you want, honey? You know, what do you want? They kind of wink at you, and that wink can really kill you. Guys, if you're single, that wink can take you to hell. So just be careful. It's a very powerful wink they can have because it just, it takes a man by his throat and just drags him all over the country. And you think, nah, I'm pretty tough. Every president has fallen, it seems like. Every executive has fallen. Pastors have fallen. Why? Because that wink. Steve, that was a great study. How you doing there? <laughs> Man, your hair is kind of growing. A little wink here. But I tell you what, gals, if you have a little wink going on, put an eye cap over that. Don't get around guys. It'll drive them crazy. It'll just drive them crazy. But anyway, sure enough, she had Judah. So they went to bed. He didn't know it was her. And all of a sudden, when they were done, she said, pay up. He said, I have no money. What? I have no money. All I have is my signet ring speaks of my authority to stamp things on my rod, which tells everyone I'm a shepherd. I'll take those two. And so he came back the next day to pay her, but she was gone. They looked around the city, but no prostitute had ever been in that city. She put on her widow's outfit again and kind of waited. Three months later, someone came to Judah. She's pregnant. And Judah went crazy, drug her in front of everybody. Who did this? And all of a sudden, they're going to kill her, and she held up the signet ring and the staff and said, whoever this belongs to, that is the dad of my child. <laughs> Judah said, can you come here a second? <laughs> can we talk? <laughs> and what Judah said is, you are more righteous than I. What he was basically saying is, what you did was wrong, but I made you do it. And your heart was right because you wanted to extend the genealogy and I was trying to destroy it. So in the eyes of God, your heart was right, but you did it the wrong way. I believe that God could have done it a different way. And I think that sometimes our heart is right, but we do things the wrong way. We want to help our husbands or our wife, but we get in the flesh trying to do it. Now, God can accomplish it, but we need to wait on the Spirit. And so we find very powerfully in this story that she did this because she was being cut off out of of that genealogy and both his boys were dead and Judah's genealogy would die if the third one didn't have a child so she was trying to protect it and God saw that and God for a moment saw this woman trying to help this genealogy and that's all it took with God and God says 
I'm going to help her. In fact, I'm going to put her in my genealogy because though her heart was right, she did it the wrong way, but I'll take her. I will identify with this woman, and I will bless this woman. So do we condone it? No. But what we need to understand is that God understood her heart. And when you have a heart for God, he'll do anything. When David had a heart to build, though he couldn't build it, Solomon built it. But what did Solomon say? This is the house that my father David built. David never built it. Solomon built it. But David had a heart, and God took the heart, and that's all God needs. And all God wants you to do is have a heart towards your children or a heart towards your husband, and God can begin to fix the rest. The second one is Rahab the harlot. She was definitely a harlot. She lived in a very great home on the side of the wall. She made a lot of money. She had a great clientele. To live there would be like living in Redondo Beach on the beach front. To live on the side of a wall of a city was very wealthy. You have the view. You were protected. Everything was going great. But also, she was a harlot. She made lots and lots of money. But she also was around a lot of guys. So she heard about this God. She heard about Jehovah opening the Red Sea from these people that came and visited. She heard about the Jordan being opened and about God feeding the children with manna, about their shoes never wearing out, and she began to get afraid of this God. So God can use even evil to speak to him and other people. God is not ashamed to do anything, but God saw her heart. And there God led these two witnesses to her in the city. Joshua unbeknownst to him, sent two witnesses into Jericho to kind of spy out the place. They ran into Rahab. Rahab hid them. She didn't have to do that. When they came to Rahab's house, she said, they're not here. She lied. And then she sent the army of Jericho the wrong way and sent the guys the right way. And God says, that's all I need to see. You have a heart towards my people. And she said, how can I be saved? And they said, we can't save you, but put a scarlet thread outside your house and anyone inside this house will be saved and she was able to bring her father her mother her sister her brother into that house and they all escaped and not only that but what is so incredible about this story she married one of the princesses of judah and there all of a sudden she was inside that genealogy and so it goes on to say she was blessed by god now why would god identify with Rahab the harlot. Would you let her into your house? No. Would you reach out? No. But God did, and God will. But it tells me sometimes you're caught doing things you wish you weren't doing. We give up on you, but God will never give up on you. I was caught for eight months in a hospital. Did God give up on me? Never. You see, he'll never give up. Did I want to come back? Yes. All God needed to know was my heart. And God held things together. All God needed to know that I had a heart and a desire to get back and do things right and to search my heart and see if there's any way that's not pleasing with him. But she exalted God and she refused and God put her name. Not only that, God put her in Hebrews chapter 11 next to Sarah in the hall of faith. So here is a Rahab the harlot in that area of faith. So don't tell me that you're too wicked. And don't tell me God doesn't care about you. Don't tell me that your divorce is messing you up. And don't tell me because you had an abortion, God can never use you again. That is a lie of the enemy. Do you have a heart towards God? If the answer is yes, God can do great things through your life. God can minister and do things that you wouldn't, can't even believe. And so we see the second thing is God once again let her marry, and she became the mother of Boaz. Interesting. God, you're incredible. The third woman is Ruth, the Moabite. And you remember her. She was a Moabite. She was cursed by God that generation, 10th generation. Ever, ever, she could never get in. And the story goes on that Naomi and her husband and two boys lived in Bethlehem. It means house of bread. And there was a famine. And the story goes on to say that they decided it'd be better to go into the city of Moab because they had food than to stay in Bethlehem with no food. Bad decision. I'd rather be in God's will with no food than to have food and be out of God's will. So they all moved to Moab. Being in Moab, the two boys found these Canaanite women, Moabites, and they married them. Now everything's happy. 
until Naomi's husband died. And then the two boys died. Now Naomi says, don't call me blessed. Naomi, call me Mara. I'm full of bitterness. She said to the two girls, We're gonna go home. I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. Ruth said, I'll go with you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your God will be my God. We'll do this thing together. The other one said, I'm going back to my people. That's okay, go. Now, this is interesting to me because she didn't worry about her race. And sometimes we put race above everything else. Doesn't make a difference what color we are. Doesn't make a difference what background we are. We use that sometimes to our own hurt. We are Christians by the grace of God. And every culture has a problem. And all of a sudden, she's a Moabite. She doesn't fit in, but she's willing to take a chance of her life and go back to this God because if she could have God, she would fit in. It's not about you and I fitting in here. We're never going to fit in, no matter what color you are, because things are changing, and you're going to realize that sooner or later. But what makes a difference is who's with you and who identifies with you and who loves you and who's going to help you and who's going to open the doors and who's going to shut the doors in your life. And so Ruth now goes back. And guess what? The moment Naomi turns back, there's a harvest in Bethlehem. What's the lesson? If I get away from God, the moment I turn back, there's going to be a harvest going on in my life. The moment I'm out of bread and I turn back to God, there's going to be bread. And then, not only that, but she ends up in Boaz's field. Who led her there? It was God. And why did Boaz look at her? She probably gave him that wink. <laughs> you know, wow, who's that woman? Man, that is one good-looking gal. And she got winked and pushed a whole bundle over, give it to her. So here Ruth is going back with this big bundle of food, and Naomi said, what happened? I don't know. I ended up with this guy named Boaz. Boaz? He owns the whole city. He is the most respected man in the world. And all of a sudden, Boaz says, I want to marry you, Ruth, and we know the story, the Redeemer. And so they become married, and through them comes Jesse, and then comes David. And we realize over and over and over again, Bethlehem became a place to go back to. And Bethlehem became a place I can have thirst and be fed, and the moment I turn back, God is going to be there. And so maybe right now you kind of feel like, you know, I'm just empty. I'm just totally empty. I made a bad decision. Turn around. Because the way back is a highway. The highways are going to be down, and the low ways are going to be brought up, and the crooked ways are going to be made straight. The moment I turn back to God, He's going to open every door in your life. God is going to restore you. It says that Jehoiakim, God picked him up and restored him after 39 years of being in prison. Why? I don't know. But God restored him to his rightful place. It was because a heathen king wanted to help him. So God can use heathens, and God can use anybody to bless you. Would you take Ruth into your home? No. She's a Moabite. Would you take anyone into your home of a different color? Uh, I don't know. You better. Because if you're looking on the outside, you've missed everything. Because it's who we have inside. And if we begin to make an issue on the outside, then we really don't have Christ inside. You see, there is no wall between us anymore. It's not about what we are, who we are, prestige, anything else. It's about this God and we say in our heart, I want this God. And God saw that. And God says, I'm going to make it work. And lastly, we come to a gal named uh, Bathsheba. And what a tragic story this is. Her story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And she was the wife of Uriah. And he was a Hittite. Everything was fine until one day David came in. He came back from war. He should never have left. The Bible says he hung up his armor. He should have never taken off his armor. And he began to look out his window and saw this woman taking a bath. He said, I want her. And the people inside of David's administration said, no, not her, David. Anybody else, but not her. Why did they say that? Because she was the granddaughter of Ahithophel. She was the granddaughter of the man that made David great. David said of Ahithophel, his counsel was as the counsel of the oracles of God. He said, we took sweet counsel together, went into the house of God. We broke bread together. We were the best of friends. Well, David, then why did you commit adultery with your best friend's granddaughter? It'd be like me going to bed with your granddaughter. It would tick you off, big time. David blew it. 
Not only did David blow it, but then David murdered Uriah. He said to Joab, Joab, send the army out. Send Uriah out and then pull the army back and leave Uriah by himself. So now Joab is involved in this killing. And then David got him drunk before he went out. He couldn't kill him. Uriah was too righteous. It was perfect until Nathan was walking home one day and God says, Nathan, my servant David has done a horrible thing. He has taken another man's wife. And Nathan came back and said, David, there's a man in your kingdom that's done everything. He has been given everything. He's the wealthy man. But he went over and took this one lamb out of this one house. And David said, away with that man. Cursed be that man. Nathan said, you are the man. God gave you everything, David. God gave you a kingdom. And God gave you righteousness. And God has given you your heart's desire. And you took one man's wife away from him. David, you're going to lose this child. And Ahithophel turned on David and went with Absalom, and they threw David out of the kingdom. Finally, David got it back. But check this out. Say for a moment, you're Bathsheba. You've been to bed with the king. Now you're part of your husband being killed. Then you have to confess that your grandfather is never going to be around to enjoy the child because the child was killed. And then Ahithophel hung himself. How do you build on that? You don't. And yet, God says, I'll take her and I'll put her in my genealogy because she will have a child and his name will be Solomon. And I'll use her for my kingdom. I'm not ashamed of her. And I'm just saying to you today, I think it offends God. I think it angers God. When you put yourself down, when you condemn yourself, when you point your fingers at other people, when you judge people, because those are his people. And none of us have it together. And I would just say in closing, maybe your life is like Tamar. You've done the right thing, but you've done it the wrong way, and people have criticized you. Yes, they will. But God will not criticize you. God will show you where you went wrong and help you and correct you, and God will receive you. When men have let you down, God will never let you down because His grace is unbelievable. Or maybe you feel like you're like Rahab. You've been caught in your sin, and it's over. It's done. There's nothing going to happen. The judgment is coming on Jericho, and God says there's a window that you can go through, but you've got to go my way. It's through the red blood of Jesus Christ. But if you go that way, then I'll let you marry this prince and I'll put you in this genealogy and it's never too late and it's never too long and you don't have to live with this woe is me attitude. Or maybe you're like Ruth. You feel like you just don't fit in. I'm kind of shy. I'm kind of nervous. Kind of, you know, I'm a different color. I'm, you know, I'm Hispanic. I'm Asian. I just don't. None of us fit in. We all have been short of the glory of God. But God has made me who I am. And if you just would yield to God, He would accept you and He would do a tremendous work and He would lead you and guide you to Jesus Christ who's your best friend. Or maybe you're like Bathsheba. You got something going on now on the side. No one knows it. And it's just leading to more and more sin in your life. And you figure, if I could just solve it and fix it, then I get back with God. It's just going to get worse. Give it up now. Just let God take it, and God can redeem it. And these four women are there in Mark chapter 1. So before you skip over genealogies, or before you say, I hate genealogies, I kind of like, like this, because God is willing to identify with me in the hospital. He's willing to identify with you when you lose control. You've got a great God. Let him love you. Just accept it. Well, I don't deserve it. We never said you did. Well, I'm so filthy. We know. We know. Are you judging me? No, we're all filthy. But how about this? I am what I am by the grace of God.